everybody, it's John DePietro, and I want to welcome you to this special edition of My Life with Kenny Rogers. Now, let me, let me set you at ease right now. We're not going to talk about my life with Kenny Rogers, but we're going to talk about the life with Kenny Rogers that our special guest has, and we're going to introduce Johnny tomorrow in just a minute. Now, his name may not ring a bell, but when I say Bruno the Bear, you're definitely going to know who I mean. But first, we want to tell you that this is one of several commemorative recordings that we're doing to um, kind of recognize the great career that Kenny had over 55 or 60 years, depending upon when you start counting. And um, if you like this, what you need to do, and if you want to get all the others, um, what you need to do is down in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, there's a little red button that says subscribe. Just hit that button, and then a bell will pop up. Hit the bell so that whenever a new one comes out, you're going to be the first, yes, folks, the first, to be notified. So with that being said, keep in mind that this is a special internet offer. It is not available in stores. So take advantage of it, hit the button now, and sit back and relax because you are going to really enjoy our visit tonight with yesterday, today, and Johnny tomorrow. Johnny, welcome to the show about you. Hey, John, thank you very much. It's a great thing you're doing here, man. I watched every single one of them. Everyone, and it, okay. Oh, and it just brings me back to uh, one of the special times of my life. So yeah. it's awesome, man. Very cool. You know, uh, I want to make sure I'm pronouncing your name right. It is Tamaro, right? Tamaro, yes. I, I like to say uh, straight as an arrow, Tamaro. Ah, okay. That's it. That's good. That's good. Because when you have an Italian name, you almost always have to. I presume it is Italian. Uh, a little bit, yeah. I'm, I'm half Sicilian, half regular slice. <laughs> Same as me. Same as me. So there might be some there might be some kinship here somewhere, but nevertheless. Absolutely. So talk about the time period that you worked with the Kenny organization and tell us specifically what you do because we don't see your name up there. Uh, Kenny Rogers with special opening act, Johnny Tomorrow. So tell so, us what uh, your role was. It was um in 1998, I auditioned for the Kenny Rogers Christmas show at the Beacon Theater, and that was my first introduction to the Kenny Rogers family. Uh, I did the Beacon Theater as understudy for Bruno the Teddy Bear, and I was a talents person as well. And then the next year, I was on tour with another show. And then four years after that, 2000, 2001, two, and three, I was Bruno the Teddy Bear on the, the tour of the toy shop all over the country. And uh, it, was, it was the best, man. It was, it was fantastic. I had a great time. And you were a... Um... You were a teddy bear that could actually sing. Yes, Bruno the teddy bear had his own song. The other toys sang a, a group song, but towards the end of the, the toy shop segment, Bruno figured out what he could finally do, and that was to sing like, uh, like a rock star. And I got to sing a song every night. And uh, my wife always was like, said, hey, you're, you're a clumsy son of a gun all the time, but in that big bear costume with those big bear feet, you were running and dancing on the stage. Like it was uh, nothing. So right. that's a funny so, joke we have in the house. I always have a tendency to go off track here as far as sequencing is concerned. But let's go back to, you saw an ad somewhere that said. Yeah. yeah. And um, so from the age of five to 27, I did community theater in Brooklyn. In my church, in my school, uh, you know, just community theater plays. We did Broadway type musicals. I averaged like two or three a year. And then I met my wife in 96. And then around the summer of 97, she said, you know, you do this community stuff as a hobby. You know, why don't you try to get paid for it? And I've never ventured into Manhattan to go audition. I was petrified. I said, okay, you know what? I'm going to do it. She goes, what do you need? I said, I need headshots and a resume. She goes, okay, I'm going to get, put, go ahead. Time out, John. Yes. You mean to tell me you're in Brooklyn? Yeah. Okay. And you were intimidated to go to Manhattan because you didn't want to take the subway or? or, or um. I didn't want to get into the professional part of it because I was uh, nervous, scared. I don't know, maybe subconsciously scared that I may really actually do it and make it. I don't know what it was, but I was content with working a regular job and doing community theater with my friends. Yeah. So there was yeah. a little element of fear. Think, oh, absolutely. Thinking that maybe you weren't good enough? Thinking either... I wasn't good enough. And then there was the other fear that what if I do get it uh -huh. and I do have to go on a stage and be professional? What if I mess up? So 
it was a whole big mind uh, thing that I was going through. So now when you look um, back on that, do you say, mm -hmm. oh, thank goodness for my wife, wife gave me that little nudge? Oh, you bet your sweet bippy. I thank God for her every day. She, and when she watches this, she's going to love it. So um, she bought me, got me the headshots, and we wrote the resume out. And I got the Backstage, which is a local, which is a newspaper that actors and actresses get for auditions in the, everywhere, in New York, in L.A., wherever. And in the non-union section, there was a blurb. It said the Kenny Rogers Christmas show. I didn't know how, to what extent it was, but I put my picture and resume in an envelope, and I sent it in. About three days later, I get a phone call. Johnny, yes, this is Vinnie Palumbo. I was like, ooh, an Italian I'm guy. <laughs> I'm up. You got Vinnie Palumbo calling Johnny tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, you sure the lines weren't being tapped? I don't, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows, man? So I'm like, wow, that's weird. And he said, um, I'm calling you from the Kenny Rogers show. We're having auditions on next week. Can you make? I said, absolutely. She goes, he said, what is this um, Kingsley the teddy bear? What is that? So there's a popular mall here in Brooklyn called the King's Plaza Mall. And every Christmas, I would be the voice and the operator of this eight-foot Christmas teddy bear. And I'd have a camera, and I'd see people approaching, and I'd speak to them. Hey, guys, how are you? Nice to see you. And I'd you know, mess with people and stuff like you're, that. You're behind a curtain somewhere. Yeah. Oh, actually, yeah. I was in this big Christmas present with all the controls, like the Wizard of Oz. It was the best. It was, I loved it. I loved it. I did it for like five years. With no ventilation. Yes, oh, no, we had a little fan. Had a little fan. <laughs> so I, I said, yeah, I did that. And he said, okay. He said, because we're looking for a wisecracking uh, teddy bear. His name is Bruno. I was like, oh, that's cool. So I go on the first audition. I walk in. I, you know, I sing my uh, song. I had just been Guys and Dolls. So I sang Luck Be a Lady Tonight. And the people behind the table were all like giggling. And they all wrote something down. And they all looking at the see what they wrote and this one wrote something and they're giggling and giggling and they said, you have anything else? I said, well, I just did Pip and I have corner of the sky. I did corner of the sky. And then they said, okay, thank you. Wait outside. So I went outside and then I, I come back, they call me back in and they said, um, do, do you want to know why we were laughing? I said, actually, I was going to ask you that. She said, because on my resume at first I had Johnny Tamaro Jr. Cause my father had passed away in 90. And he was junior. I'm the third. And I put on my, I, ma I named myself Johnny Tamara Jr. in honor of him. So they were laughing because I sang Luck Be a Lady and they all wrote down Frank Sinatra Jr. Uh. On, everybody wrote it down on their paper. And I was like, oh, that's weird. So they said, can you come back at two o'clock and dance? And I said, yes. And I came back at two o'clock. I did a little choreography and went home. Now, in the meantime, between the time they said, can you come back at two o'clock and two o'clock, are you trembling or now you're starting to gain confidence or are you just like, I have no idea what's going on? I have no idea what's going on because this was my first audition on the island of Manhattan. And I'm nervous and I'm like questioning, what does that mean? Does it mean they, they like me? Does it mean they just want to see if I can dance? So I call my girlfriend. I said, I have to stay because at two o'clock, they need me to dance. She's okay, great. And I went upstairs and they, and they showed us a very simple choreography and I and, and I was like oh okay all right that was easy okay and then I went home and then two days later I got a phone call to go back for a call back from Vinny from Vinny yeah but that wasn't the first call back the only call back that was the first one that wasn't the only one there were five more after that hold on hold on hold on <clears throat> so you had like six rounds of of um auditions going Six rounds. Six rounds. Okay. Um, and with all different people, all different, uh, about seven different uh, combinations of people who are going to be the toys. And I'll never forget the last one. I'm, I'm early, like I always am, and I'm walking through the door to go up the stairs to go audition, and Kenny Rogers is walking out. And I'm just like, uh, 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 and he's like, nice to see you. I'm like, hello. And he leaves. He's got no bodyguard with him. Nothing. I was like, what? Was that, was that him? I don't even know. Maybe. I don't was know. That really? Was that was really, that really him? Because yeah. you have to understand, John, growing up in Brooklyn, rarely went on vacation. But when we did, we drove three and a half hours to the Catskills in my father's Malibu. 
And in the Malibu, there was an 8-track player. And in the 8-track player, we had three 8-track tapes. The GM, General Motors, 8-track tape that came with the car. The compilation. The, the only whatever. Tape. Yeah. Um, Barry Manilow's Greatest Hits and Kenny Rogers' Greatest Hits. And that's all we listened to going in the car. So when I got, when he, I saw him, I was just like, what is going on here? I went upstairs and we had, then he came back upstairs and we had the last big audition. And then that night I got a phone call from Vinny that I got the part as the understudy for Bruno and the townsperson. Hmm. So I'm told that uh, just before, now here's what I'm, here's what I understand. And I just, I tried to do some research on you to make sure that uh, you're, um, you know, that I don't mess this all up. Okay. Um, when a show is about ready to open in New York, whether it's Broadway or off Broadway, this, this in fact actually was broad, on Broadway, but off Broadway, right? Because the Beacon Theater is technically on Broadway, but it's, it's not yeah, it's on the there. It's on the street of Broadway, but it's not a, 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 an, equity, an equity house. Yeah. To yeah. do a Broadway show. So I, I'm told that what they do is they put this week of previews on, which are basically rehearsals with the live audience. Yes. And uh, they even sell popcorn and candy-coated snacks and, and overpriced beverages, et cetera. Yep. Um, and just before you're ready to go on, you were handed a bear head. Yes. Do I have uh, that right? You are correct. The day of the first preview, we were just finishing up our last rehearsal. And as the understudies, we have to have a put-in rehearsal where we do the show you know, all the way through. And that wasn't going to happen until the following Tuesday. So here we are. Last show, last rehearsal before previews. We're sitting in the wings. The choreographer is running across the stage, making a beeline for me. And he says, uh, Johnny, um, Steve has the chicken pox. You're on. And I'm like, what? Now, Steve Calzaretta was Bruno the teddy bear. He had done it the year before on a tour. Yeah. And he has the chicken pox. So I'm like, what does that mean? They're like, you're, you're, you're performing tonight. Never rehearsed, never did the song, nothing. So I ran to Warren Hartman. Awesome. The, the Warren Hartman is the best. He, make, he makes love to the piano. I used to love watching him play the piano. He's amazing. I run to him. I go, Warren, I have to learn this song. He says, come with me. We go to the music room. He teaches me the song. I go upstairs, I put on my bear uniform, I figure it, it works, it, it doesn't fit, it fits, this fits, that fits, we adjust. And then we do a rehearsal, and then that night, first preview, goes on without a hitch. And I'm like, what just happened? And I couldn't believe it. And I honestly believe, I don't know if anybody's uh, spiritual out there, but I honestly yeah. believe it was my father bringing me around the stage. It, it, really, it really blew me away. It really cool. There's away. probably ghosts in that theater because that's a big theater. Absolutely. Absolutely. Big theater. So um, I understand you, you did it through rehearsals and the other guy had a um, miraculous recovery. And then the rest of the, what, three week run, um, you did yeah. your normal towns. Yeah, he did it. So, in the, so the best thing about the previews for me, not really for Steve, was that in the previews, you can make any adjustments you need to make before you open official opening night. And the reviewers can come to review it. <laughs> and I got reviewed. And they said, Bruno the Teddy Bear's mannerisms were reminiscent to the line, the cowardly line from The Wizard of Oz. And that, I love that. That blew me away. That was great. Yeah. So what was it like in that? Well, first of all, was the singing live or did you put it on track? Uh, the singing was live. The singing was live. So you were mic'd inside a bear costume. Yes, yes. Uh, and the, the, the Beacon Bear costume was a little different than the Tor Bear costume. The Beacon Bear costume, you can see my eyes and around my face, and the microphone was on my cheek. Okay. And the bear costume on Tor, the microphone was secured inside the head. And, um, you know, I'd set them up every night before the show, and we do a sound check, and uh, I do it live every night. And, so, you know, it was, it was great. The first couple of nights, you know, I'm huffing and puffing because I'm running on the stage. But after that, it just went uh, smooth as silk. We, we so um, move to the regular tour now a couple of years later. You got, you're in that outfit. 
sweating like a pig? I was, uh, I think I lost about 10 pounds every December because we, I dance around it. It was a fat, it was a fat suit, then the first suit, and then a t-shirt over that. And then the big head. Oh, that's right. That's right. The t-shirt. Yeah. And the mouth of the bear was uh, elastic straps that, it, that went around my head. And it was like this. So every time I opened my mouth, the bear's mouth moved, which was awesome. And we only, we only did about 18 and a half minutes of either dialogue or singing. The rest of the time, we're sitting on the shelves of the toy shop, frozen as if we're toys, stuffed toys and stuff like that. Uh, which is harder to do. Yeah. yeah. Which is harder and to plus, do. Plus there's drip, there's sweat dripping down my nose yeah. and I can't get it. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> so yeah. The other reason I asked you that is because it, early in my radio career, the ice capades were my client. And um, they, we were doing a promotion with them and they're, the star of the show was the Snorks, not the Smurfs, but the, the Snorks. Snorks. Yes, I remember them. And I had to wear a snork outfit for three or four hours at a at a local department store. And you had to come out of it every 20 minutes to breathe. And the yeah. thing is, that suit gets sent around the country in in advance of the show. So you don't know who wore it just before you. But you did oh. know that they didn't clean it because Ooh. it stunk. And... Um, you know, well, so you had to do that every night, and of course, you're in the you're in the uh, you're in the costume the whole time, you know, from an hour before showtime, yeah, until yeah, till the end of the show. Um, so tell me during the time when you're on the road, because of the fact that every theater was different, sometimes they had giant wings that you could go off stage and you know take the head off, you know, for a period of time. Sometimes they're narrow little rickety staircases. Yeah. Um, any stories of mishaps falling down a flight of stairs or uh, being uh, done at by an NRA person or? Uh... <laughs> uh, there were, you know, we, every time I got to the venue, I would make it a point to get to the stage manager and say, where's my room? Because I had a quick change. I was a townsperson in act one uh, in the first scene. And then I was the cameraman reporter in the second scene. And then I had a run off stage and put him on that quick and I had a little a little um pipe and drink booth for myself with a light and stuff like that well one morning one one show i was getting ready and the pipe and drape and i'm getting ready and getting ready all of a sudden as i'm getting ready the pipe and drape just goes collapses and i'm getting dressed but luckily there was a curtain that was cut between the stage and the the rest of the rises of the of the, of the arena if that curtain wasn't there Everybody, I mean, I saw heads, and if they were looking my way, they would have seen me, but they were concentrating on Kenny, thank goodness. But yeah, that was one of the, one of the funniest mishaps that I had. Yeah. But yeah, and then, and then after every show, I'd take them off, turn everything inside out, hang it up, and I'd Febreze the crap out of it. And Keith Bugis would hang it on the truck. He wouldn't go in a bin because he had the air out. <laughs> oh, hang it from the truck. Oh, that's too funny. Yeah, Keith is going to be on with us, and Dawn's going to be on with us as well. Ah, awesome. And uh, we're working on Arciero to find her. We don't know where she is. Oh, and, that's great. Oh, you got her? You got her? Oh, wait, no, mm -hmm. I've got her number. I just haven't had I, ha her. I have a number, yeah. She has to call her yet. Um, so tell me about the band, um, working with the band, and then tell me about the crew uh, and how they made you feel, or if they made you feel, part of the show. Um. The band, I, I you know, the band I know since the Beacon years, so then 98 that time. And uh, I didn't know what I was walking into, the extent of what it was. I didn't know, you know, how big it was. And it, it was a big production. It was, it was like in competition with the Radio City Music Hall Christmas Spectacular. Yeah. And uh, it, was, it was huge. And the Beacon is 2,900 seats. It's tremendous. And when I first met Warren... It was like I was meeting uh, uh, an old, a big cousin, like a cousin I haven't seen in a while. Mm. And then everybody else, Steve Glassmeyer and Chuck and Randy and, and Lynn, it was, and to watch them play, I'm telling you, Warren, it would be, I would watch Warren play and it would just be like, you know, it's, it's funny you say that, Johnny, because when I was interviewing Warren earlier this week, 
I said to him, Warren, when I would watch you on stage, you were 110% immersed in that music. And a lot of people, you know, performers, they're looking at the crowd and waving to people. Warren was 110%, right? Concentrated on that craft. At the Beacon, they were in the pit. Yep. And some people weren't in the pit. They were in another room to the side of the pit. It was like weird. So I, when I wasn't on stage, I was in the pit watching them play. Because all of them, Lynn and Chuck, all of them, they had this thing about them that w what everybody should have when they do something like that. I'm here. This is Kenny Rogers. I'm playing his music. This is, you know, the best job in the world. And that's how they played. And they, they it was, it was magical. It was mm. Magical. Well, it's interesting that it's what, 15 years later and you can rattle their names off without any hesitation at all. I know. I, Oh my God, they're the best. The, because they all made you, they made you feel like you were part of the family. I was talking to Don Bugas the other night. Nobody ever had a crass word to say about anybody. There was never an argument. I never heard anybody yell. The only time I heard Kenny yell was when he went, Gene or T-Ray. That's it. I never heard him yell at anybody. There was never arguments. Just calling them over to... Uh... Yeah. So he was, he's he's in the dressing room and he's like calling them over. But other than that, I never heard him yell. Never heard him say a bad word about anybody. Nobody on that. And it was it was it was a family that you 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 thought you were there forever. Yeah. Like how were, do you how did how did that happen? It was, were you surprised that uh, after the show, instead of going out and partying till the wee hours of the night, they just went back to the apartment that they got for him? Yeah. And crashed. You yeah. know, yeah. like like businessmen. Yeah. They would never go out. I mean, and, and I, when I did Tony and Tina's wedding, I never went out. I would always get on the train and come home because it was, uh, you know, uh, you just, you do your job and then you have to have that downtime. Right. To just, uh, you know, decompress. Yeah. Although I do remember a couple of times when we went down on a Saturday and there were, there was an afternoon and an evening show that we ran across to the, to the cottage restaurant, one block. The one Chinese block. restaurant, right? Yeah. Yeah, a little yep. Asian restaurant that Chuck introduced us to. It. And I, the thing I remember the most about it is that it was, um, they, the wine was, the wine came with the meal. Yep. Which was, which was pretty cool. I never went there between shows, you know, during the matinee. Well, that's true. <laughs> you got to watch what you eat. Yes. I didn't. <laughs> I, did, I didn't. I just ate. Um, so how about the crew? Because oh. you needed the crew to... Um, you know, guide you, especially with wardrobe issues and um, set changes and all that stuff. Um, the crew, I learned at a very young age, you never upset the band or the crew because they are, they hold and, and drive the show. Even though you're on stage, they're behind the scenes and in the pit and they're playing your music and they're moving your sets. So you always be nice to the band and always nice to the crew. But it was easy because the crew was just like, they were like regular guys. And they knew their stuff. I mean, the riggers that would climb the, the, the ropes to do the, the hang, the, the, the terrace of the lights and the, um, the speaker system. And they were all great. All of them were great. Jeff Metter, the lighting guy. Yes, oh, yeah. my gosh. Yeah. Everybody was, it was, it was great. Yeah. Jeff and Keith and uh, um, uh, what's his name? The sound, the other sound guy. Frank. Uh, his, his, Frank Farrell. Oh. Yeah. They were all they were all superb. Yeah, Frank was able earlier this week. Um, the interesting thing is, if the crew doesn't like you, they could very easily sabotage your mic sure. or your costume. Yes. And <laughs> and make you very embarrassed. Yep. Out on yep. that stage. I know one story that Frank told me this week when they were uh, they they did like a month straight with the Righteous Brothers, and at the last show when the Righteous Brothers would come out, because Kenny was doing In the Round at the time, um, they would walk out and then reach down for a microphone. So that was um, Mike Wolpert's job, not Frank, but Mike's job, Mike Wolpert's job to uh, give them the mic. So the last night, they, instead of giving them a microphone, because they're grabbing it in the dark, you know, okay. spotlight, they just got a kielbasa and put a um, microphone windscreen on it and handed it up to them and they start singing. Oh, that's and They don't hear anything in their monitors. And they finally, uh, 
was either Hatfield or Medley saw it and realized what it was and just, he, he said, they just they had to stop the show and laugh. Oh. But um, again. No, fun thing like that would happen. Yeah, the, 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 the crew was always good for a laugh. Always be. The crew was always good for a laugh. So when you heard of Kenny's passing, um, what were the thoughts that went through your mind? Hmm. You know, it was, it was, of course, it was during the quarantine. So, yeah, right. Um, we were, I was sleeping, and my wife never wakes me up. There's no need to wake me up. I either have my alarm or I get up. And she, she shook me. I said, What's the matter? And she just said one word Kenny. She said, Kenny. And um, you know, <clears throat> he, what I did with his show, it changed my whole life. It, it changed the direction of it because if I didn't go on that audition, I wouldn't have got different steps that that happened. So, and meeting him and his and his family and everybody else that was involved in Kenny Rogers productions really is uh, one of the highlights of my life. They really embraced me and, and, and took me in because my father, I, when I was 19, my father passed suddenly. He was 46 years old and that was in 1990. Yep. And I was, you know, I was like lost. Like, what am I going to do? What is going on here? So I found, another community theater in 91 and they saved me. So theater basically has helped me through a lot of times in my life the, the, taking me in and, and allowing me to do my, you know, craft and my acting, my singing, whatever. And then in 98, when I decided I try to do this as a career, who better? And I didn't think this at the time, but who better to do this with and to start me up, then the legend that is Kenny Rogers. I mean, he made me feel as famous as him. No matter where we were, he never made us feel like he was Kenny Rogers. You know, he was a regular guy from Houston, Texas. And he was just, you know, an inspiration. Uh, he taught so many things without sitting us down and saying, Listen, this is what I want to tell you. He just did it, and you saw it happen, and, and it was, uh, I was devastated. I was devastated. He was a, very, a big, huge impact in my life. Mm. And it's even crazier now because, again, as you mentioned, when he passed during COVID, um, there was never a ceremony that was open to the public. Right. And, um, you know, a lot of guys in the band and a lot of other people that are, you know, in the crew, et cetera, ha have, they're upset. No, I'm not upset. That's not the right word, but they feel lacking because there's never been any closure where everybody could be together and just hug. Yeah, yeah, because the all way. the pe all the people that would have been there have the one common thread, the one common connection, and that's him. And we all have, you know, our own stories about Kenny, but when we all see each other, like after the tour ended in 2003, every Christmas after that, I'd get in my car on December 23rd and I'd drive to Westbury, Westbury. Music Fair. Westbury, right? Westbury Music Fair. And I'd see my friends and I'd, and I'd sit backstage with him and I'd sit in his dressing room. And my son, when my son was born, he flipped out. I brought my son with me and my son was like two years old or one and he was holding him and, and the guys in the band, every you know, and and being a, a you know a little Italian kid from Brooklyn, you know, it, you it, at, at first you're like, is this genuine? Are is this they really? Yeah. Are, is this real? Yeah. Are they genuine? And it, it it was, and they were, and that that you know that it says so much for the 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 type of human beings that they are. And, Mm. It's, it's a, it's a, 
I'm telling you, it was, it was the, the, one of the best times of my life. Any idea where the, where the bear suit is now? Um, well, they, they, they resurrected the toy shop. Uh, oh, with, out uh, yes, out in Branch with Alan Thicke. Yeah. And then unfortunately, when, after Alan Thicke passed, they got Billy Dean. Billy Dean, yeah. And then there was a guy playing Bruno. He wore the, the Bruno fur suit, but a different T-shirt. I'm assuming, I don't know if they still have the, the, the warehouse in Kentucky, but maybe it's know. in the warehouse it, in Kentucky. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting because there was a picture somewhere. I think Dawn posted it uh, not too long ago. And Kenny's son, Justin, said, where is that? Yep. <laughs> where Jordan, that? Jordan. And Jordan, I commented, yeah. he goes, this is a great, uh, I, I want to know where that costume is. I want it. Yeah. And because Bruno was the coolest. And then yeah. I commented on that. And I said, yeah, he was a pretty cool guy. Okay, and then Dawn, Dawn yeah. said, you, you should talk to Johnny Tamara because he knows Bruno very well. Wink, wink. Oh, I, call, I used to call the, the boys on their birthday in the Bruno voice. I used oh. to go, hey, guys, it's Bruno. Oh. Happy yes. birthday. Oh, Wanda would flip. She was like, can you call them again? I was like, absolutely. Whatever you want me to call them, I'll call them. So you had speaking lines as well. Yes. Okay. Yes. Give, give me a give me a reprise of a couple speaking. <clears throat> Who uh, did you talk to? Were you talking to Mister to Baxter? The other toys. Oh, the other toys. Okay. The other toys, and uh, I said, uh, "Hey guys, and guys, I finally figured out what I could do. I got a song for Mister Perfect. Hit it!" And then I'd sing the Mister Perfect song. Hit it. Which okay. is great. And the band, oh, we, it was, oh, my God, you're making me, I'm, fe I feel like I'm there. It's so, uh, it's the yep. best. I love it. I love it. Yep. Yep. That's good. So what would you say, um, you know, what, how much did the Kenny influence um, give you the motivation to go on to, to the other acting things that you've done since then? So there are things that I learned doing that show that I now take into my other job, whether it be acting or regular job or whatever. Um, always make people feel, like I was telling my wife this the other day, when you get to a certain age where you, I guess you, you start to mature, I think I'm, I'm finally doing that at 49, <laughs> and you, you start, you decide you wanna take the high road. So when, you, when somebody's doing something that you don't approve of, find something positive about it and focus on that. Don't focus on the negative. And always, always like compliment people and make people feel like they're not better than you, but make them feel great. And that's what Kenny showed me. And after the Kenny, at, at the, after the Beacon Show, because the director of the Beacon Show was another Italian, Larry Pellegrini, and he's uh, oh, Larry Pellegrini, Johnny Tomorrow. Okay. Yes, and Larry Pellegrini is one of the writers, and the original writers, and the director of Tony and Tina's Wedding. That oh, was okay. running off. Okay. Yeah, was running on off Broadway from '88 until that time, and then the the Beacon show is going on, and Christmas Eve, I get a phone call from Larry. And he says, Merry Christmas and Merry Christmas. He goes, what are you doing uh, January 3rd to March 26th? I said, nothing. I quit my job to do this show. Why? What's up? He goes, I'm going to send you on the national tour of Tony and Tina's wedding. You'll understudy all the guys. I was like, okay. And I did that. And then went on the national tour again after that, the second national tour as Tony. And then I was in Tony and Tina's wedding and the off-Broadway production for 11 years. And all stemming from that Larry Pellegrini connection back. All, yeah, all stemming from what I did with Bruno at the first week of previews when I went on and, and, and according to Kenny, saved the show. That's what he said, not my words. Say, <laughs> re, re, rewind that again about what Kenny said. Kenny, I was leaving. I was coming down the, the, the stairs at the Beacon Theater. Those round go, stairs. To, go all the way down to go home. And I passed Kenny's room. He's like, Johnny. I said, what's, hey, Kenny. He goes, come here for a second. I go in. He's getting changed. 
he's, he's, he puts his hand out. He says, I want to thank you very much. You saved the toy shop. And I was like, no, we all saved the toy shop. I didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> because in the show, That's right. the yeah, toys yeah, yeah. saved the toy shop. And everybody, I said, no, we all saved the toy shop. He goes, no, Johnny, if you didn't know your part and what you were doing, we couldn't have done the second act. We couldn't have done the toy shop. You saved it. And I'm like, okay, thank you. You're welcome. I don't know what to say. So I'm like, all right. And I left. Uh, I, that was a very weird experience. But yeah, I guess he's right. Because if I didn't know what I was doing, we wouldn't have been able to do that part of the show. Yeah. So, yeah. What are you going to do? You can't. I mean, it's about a bear or, and, you know, a major character. But yeah. you know what? As we wind this conversation down, it really all goes back to your wife saying, if you've done it for a hobby, why not do it for a living? Yep. And I've been lucky enough for the past 22 years to uh, have some sort of a living doing it. I mean, I have to have a regular job here and there to, to supplement the income. Fill in the gaps. Yeah, for, but for the most part, like I did an off-Broadway show in 2016, uh, a show by the name of A Room of My Own about an Italian-American family in the village in 1979. And we were lucky enough to have Ralph Macchio and Mario Cantone in the show. And right now we're working on a, a big musical called The Wanderer. And it's about Dion DiMucci yeah, yeah. and his life from the age of 17 to 29. And I play his father. And it's a great show and it's a great part. And we were supposed to be at the Paper Mill Playhouse in New Jersey, uh, uh, May until June, but that got uh, postponed to next year. So yeah, um, if, if my wife said, you know, try doing this as to make a living, and I, it's it's not been that half bad, you know. I've been to every state in the country, and I've been to Japan, and uh, have you been to foreign places like New Jersey? Sometimes I go over to the bridge. Sometimes. Depends. Depends. Okay. But you don't talk about that. <laughs> no. No. So, you know what? We just want to thank you so much for taking time from your busy oh. night. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's so interesting to talk to people. Um, and we got your name from, I think, Warren or, or Randy or one of those guys said, wow. you know, you, you need to talk to the toy shop guys because we had a blast with them over a five or six year period. And uh, your name was right on the tip of their tongue. And uh, somebody, somebody found your phone number. Um, I don't know, whatever it was. But you know what? Like you said, if, if you do extra, instead of just doing the minimum, people notice it. Because today, everybody does the minimum. Yeah, yeah. And my, you know, my father told me one thing that I tell my son to this day. And he tells me to be quiet because I tell him all the time. I said, just be nice to everybody. Yeah. Just be nice. And that's uh, something that Kenny showed me every day we were together. And one of the best parts that I forgot to mention about the Beacon show was that opening night, we all went to our dressing rooms to get ready. And on everybody's station, there was a dozen Krispy Kreme donuts. Ooh. And yet that was fantastic. Because Kenny loved Krispy Kreme donuts. So that was great. But yeah, he told me to be nice. And, and, and that's what my father told me. And that's what Kenny was. Kenny was just nice. And he was one of the, 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 the best guys that I ever met in my life. So. And if you binge watch these 20 episodes that we have so far with, and, and it seems what happens is that every time we do one, that person calls me back after and says, you know, you got to talk to this one, this one, this one. And um, so somebody said the other day, I'm going to have you talk to Terry Williams from the first edition. And then they said, you know, and then you got to talk to Mike Settle. Then you got to talk to uh, uh, Mary Miller and yeah. Jean, Jean Lorenzo. So, so wow. you start with one and you end up with four more. Yeah, what, what you're doing here is uh, so great. And, you know, it'll show everybody what we all knew, that this man was a gem. A gem. Great. Johnny, tomorrow is the name Bruno is the character and we want to thank you so much and uh, let you know folks that if you want to hear all of these just hit that subscribe button down the bottom right hand side of your screen hit that red button and then there's a bell that lights up I don't know if the, the bells light up whatever it is 
uh, they ring and then hit that thing again. It's like you're at a like like you're at a Pac-Man game, and you'll get every one of these. And and uh, our guest tonight has been Johnny Tomorrow, who played Bruno the Bear in the toy shop. And uh, Johnny, we want to thank you so much for being with us. John, it was my pleasure. And uh, can I talk about what I'm doing now? Sure, go right ahead. Yeah. So uh, during the pandemic, the producer and the writer of The Wanderer called me up and said, what are we doing? Are we going to sit down on our behind and do nothing? I was like, I don't know. I, I guess what I've been doing for the past, whatever. He goes, I have an idea. So we have a web series on YouTube. It's called The Honey Zoomers. And it's about a brother and sister that get quarantined inside the brother's apartment because the sister's husband cheated on her and he ha she had to move in with him. And it's the first sitcom about the pandemic filmed during the pandemic. And it's in the style of the honeymooners and the odd couple that own the family. It's in black and white. And every episode, there are about 15 right now, every episode has something to do with what we're dealing with right now, everybody in the world. Okay. So, where can uh, we find it? You can go to thehoneyzoomers.com. Spell that. Or on YouTube, you can just type in The Honey Zoomers and you'll find it. Go up this episode. There's 15 episodes right now. Great. With more to come. Yes, absolutely. Wait, I just finished filming uh, 15. It should be 15 should be tomorrow night or Thursday morning. And as they say, but wait, there's more. Uh, there's going to be 39 episodes. Oh, wow. Okay. Just like The Honeymooners. So I'm going to do what uh, they did to you just before the uh, show was supposed to start back in New York City when, uh, when Steve got chicken pox. I'm going to tell you. So Johnny, close the show out here. All right. Um, it's been a fantastic pleasure to be here talking to you, John, about my good friend, Kenny Rogers. And sometimes I can't even believe I could say those words because he was a really good friend to me and my family. and. Uh, I miss him and uh, his legacy will live on and his music lives on and he'll be, uh, he'll be uh, talked about for hundreds and hundreds of years. Great. Thanks. Thanks for watching everybody. Okay, buddy. Maybe eight tracks will make a comeback by then. I have an eight track player. So there you go. Make them, make them. See you buddy. <laughs> have a great day. Take care, John. Thank you. You too. Yeah.